For the last few weeks, the world's focus has been on Venezuela as Trump pushes for regime change. Almost every media outlet paints the same picture, that Venezuela is a brutal dictatorship in a starving nation, one that demands intervention, and that they finally have a solution to the crisis, a legitimate claim to power by an opposition politician, Juan Guaido. As civil society collapses, America confronts the socialist dictatorship. Maduro stole the previous election. He locked up and he tortured anyone trying to unseat him. There's no toilet paper some days in Caracas. They're eating zoo animals. What happened? Well, you know what happened. They implemented socialism. The eyes of the revolution are everywhere. President Maduro's militia still trying to keep the people in line. Guaido is investing in the people, whereas Nicolas Maduro is investing in the army. So this is a neighborhood uh, Juan Guaido feels safe in. This is one of the wealthy neighborhoods of Caracas. Despite the faux dissent against Trump's domestic policies, the corporate media has lined up to support his coup in Venezuela. Tech giants like Facebook and Twitter are doing their part to shape the narrative too, recently removing 2,000 accounts for spreading pro-Maduro messaging to, quote, influence people. Would you personally negotiate with Nicolas Maduro to convince him to exit? Well, he has requested a meeting and I've turned it down because we're very far along in the process. Trump has said a military option is on the table, with coup leader Juan Guaido suggesting he will request it. People don't recognize that Hezbollah has active cells. The Iranians are impacting the people of Venezuela. We have an obligation to take down that risk for America. All options are on the table. All options are on the table. All options are on the table. The United States now looks forward to watching each corner of the triangle fall in Havana, in Caracas, in Managua. The days of socialism and communism are numbered. Libertad, Libertad, Libertad. Their latest cynical stunt is weaponizing aid to hold Maduro's government hostage. In the latest war escalation, the U.S. announced the delivery of so-called aid via military aircraft to the border. It's an abomination to humanity to stop basic necessities and goods from entering your country to help your own people. Is there any concern that something like this would provoke him from doing something even more drastic? What happens if he doesn't let that aid through? Well, look, the aid is going to get through. And I think ultimately the question is whether it gets through uh, in, in a way that he's cooperative with or in a way that he's not. From Iraq to Libya to Venezuela, what usually preempts U.S. military intervention is the pretext of a humanitarian crisis. And right now, pretty much everyone speaks with authority about the fact that there is a human rights crisis caused by the Maduro government. What is surprisingly absent from the discourse is testimony from the human rights investigator designated by the UN to assess said crisis. Alfred de Zayas was the first UN investigator to go to Venezuela in 21 years. He has written 13 reports for the UN Human Rights Council, but his report on Venezuela was largely ignored. I spoke with Alfred to find out why. If you know a humanitarian crisis in Gaza and in Yemen, and in Syria, and mm. in Sudan, and in Somalia, you wouldn't say there is a humanitarian crisis uh, in Venezuela. And at no point when I was walking the streets in Venezuela did I feel uh, threatened, or did I see violence, or did I uh, consider that this country was undergoing a humanitarian crisis. But uh, I see human rights more and more being instrumentalized to destroy human rights. There is a weaponization of human rights. I see the rule of law being instrumentalized to destroy the rule of law, and unfortunately, the complicity of the mainstream media. What I'm saying to you, I think it would have been sensible to say it to the BBC. It would have been sensible to say it to the New York Times and to the Washington Post and to The Economist and to the Financial Times. But uh, at no time since I returned from Venezuela and since my report was officially presented to the Human Rights Council, have I been approached by any of these uh, organs who actually have a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis you and vis-a-vis -vis me and vis-a-vis -vis the people of the United States to inform.
You know, many people will say the crisis cannot be blamed on the sanctions, of course, that sanctions are being used as a scapegoat uh, for Maduro's economic failures. Alfred, talk about the impacts of the sanctions thus far and the new sanctions that were just implemented on the state oil company. What is particularly Machiavellian, what is particularly cynical, is to cause an economic crisis that threatens to become a humanitarian crisis. That's what the United States has done through the financial blockade, through the um, uh, sanctions. And then to say, oh, we're going to offer you uh, humanitarian help. We're sending so and so many tons of humanitarian assistance uh, through U.S. aid. We're sending it to Colombia and we're going to deliver it. Now, uh, I think that here uh, Juan Guaido is uh, being uh, the, um, shall we say, the jockey. He is riding on the Trojan horse of uh, the United States. But uh, the solution of the problem is much easier than uh, the Band-Aid of sending uh, some packages of food or of medicine. Uh, the solution is in my report. What I told uh, the uh, Human Rights Council uh, is that the financial blockade has had uh, extremely adverse human rights impacts. Obviously, the origin of the current economic crisis is in the fall, the dramatic fall in the price of oil. But uh, normally, you would be able to fix that. Uh, a country as wealthy as Venezuela should have been able uh, to borrow money uh, on its enormous natural resources and uh, then would have been able to buy and sell like anybody else. But no, uh, the United States has made sure that uh, because of the threat of enormous penalties to the U.S. Treasury, uh, the banks have been closing the accounts of uh, the Venezuelan government and of the uh, Petroleos of Venezuela. Already in July uh, 2017, uh, Citibank unexpectedly decided without prior notice and arbitrarily to close the bank accounts of the Central Bank of Venezuela and the Bank of Venezuela in November 2017. Uh, again, uh, Citibank uh, blocked uh, the uh, transfer uh, for a shipment of more than 300,000 doses uh, of insulin. In November 2017, the company Euroclear retained $1.65 billion that the Venezuelan government had paid for the purpose uh, for the purchase of food and medicine. Uh, CITCO, the uh, uh, Venezuelan state oil company based in the U.S. has not been able to transfer its profits outside the United States of America. It needs that money to buy mm -hmm. food and medicine. And it is in the neighborhood, I think, by now of nine or uh, ten billion uh, dollars that have been withheld. There again, Wells Fargo Bank uh, withheld and canceled payment of seven million five hundred thousand made by Brazil to Venezuela uh, for the sale of electricity. In May 2018, the Venezuelan Minister of People's Power uh, informed that a financial transaction amounting to seven million dollars for the purchase of dialysis supplies for patients, including children and adolescents, uh, requiring such treatment had been blocked. So uh, you see here uh, the immorality of it, but not only the immorality of it, uh, there is personal criminal liability uh, for the impact of these sanctions. I mean, I am certain that the increase in uh, child mortality, the increase uh, in maternal mortality, the increased deaths for uh, lack of insulin or lack of uh, antiretroviral drugs uh, is a direct result of this blockage so that uh, Venezuela has not been able 
to uh, purchase what its people uh, deserve. It's not like the government doesn't want to distribute. Is that the government is being, through an external economic war, is being asphyxiated. And that was the name of the game. What the United States intended to do was to create a situation whereby the people or the military uh, would topple the government and then uh, the one percent uh, could again come in and could again control the wealth uh, of Venezuela. Venezuela had succeeded in uh, bringing uh, millions and millions of Venezuelans out of extreme poverty. Nobody cared in the 1980s and 90s that there were millions of Venezuelans dying of hunger and malnutrition. No one cared. It, it was a government that was palatable to Washington and a government that was a right-wing government. The moment that a left-wing government came in power, uh, priority number one in Washington was to topple it. And now you have the Bank of England seizing the gold, right, from Maduro, over a billion dollars worth, and threatening to give it to Juan Guaido. That's yet another violation of international law. But uh, try to bring the United States before the International Criminal Court or before the International Court of Justice. Uh, what I think is important now would be for the General Assembly to adopt a resolution condemning the sanctions and asking that the sanctions be lifted because sanctions kill. I would also like to see right. the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court investigate to what extent uh, the deaths already occurred in connection uh, with the sanctions amount to a violation of Article 7 of the Statute of Rome. Article 7 defines crimes against humanity. Now, when you deliberately impose sanctions and financial blockades and an economic war that as asphyxiates a country's economy and thereby make it very difficult for that country to provide the necessary food and medicines to its population, and as a consequence, thousands of people die, you have a case of crime against humanity. But the narrative in the mainstream press completely ignores it. When they refer to a humanitarian crisis, they put the entire fault on the government and uh, they say, well, socialism is a proven failure. Socialism will never work. Therefore, you have to have regime change. Juan Guaido swore himself in and was backed by the rest of the free world. And he has been recognized as such by the rational half of the world. Now a long list of countries joining the U.S. supporting Guaido. The sea of yellow you see there now recognizes the opposition leader Juan Guaido. This coup is painted as legitimate by the media and political establishment because of the international support from major U.S. allies in Europe and Latin America. But let's take a quick look around the world to see what that support really looks like. As usual, the African continent is erased from the dialogue. There, 51 countries recognize Maduro. Only one, Morocco, recognizes Waido. Then there's Asia and Oceania, where again, only Australia recognizes Waido. The other 33 nations recognize Maduro. Moving on to the Middle East, where staunch US ally Israel is the only country to recognize Waido. The rest in the region continue to support Maduro's presidency. Next, the Americas and the Caribbean. Despite 17 countries across the continent recognizing Waido, 19 countries still support Maduro. While the majority of US allied Latin American powers back Waido, in the Caribbean, the Bahamas is the only nation to do so. Lastly, there's Europe. Powers like France, Britain, and Germany have united behind the US to support their puppet in Venezuela. Even so, stark opposition to this coup exists within Europe including Italy, Greece, Norway, Switzerland, and the Vatican. So by international community, they really just mean a minority led by the white imperialist and colonizer nations. 
erasing non-white nations as members of the international community. How is this coup a violation of international law? Well, international law has been violated by the United States by interfering in the internal affairs of states. The United Nations Charter is fairly clear, uh, especially in Articles 1 and 2, where the sovereign equality of states uh, is uh, guaranteed, where the right of self-determination of all peoples is guaranteed. The thing is, uh, it's not for the uh, United Nations to decide this is the better government. Uh, people determine their governments. That is the democratic way to go about it. And Article 2, Paragraph 3 says that if there's any dispute among states, those disputes shall be solved peacefully through peaceful negotiation. And then Article 2, Paragraph 4 prohibits not only the use of force, but the threat of the use of force. And Trump has been saying again and again that the military option is on the table. Well, the military option is a major violation of international law. The corporate media has dutifully parroted the Pentagon line that a guy who 80% of Venezuelans had never heard of before was a legitimate leader seeking to restore democracy. So who is Juan Guaido, the lucky 35-year-old man just anointed king? Well, before this coup attempt, Guaido was much better known in elite U.S. circles than he was in his home country of Venezuela. He received graduate degrees from prestigious D.C. University, George Washington, where he studied under a former IMF director, as well as attended private business school in Caracas. Waido's roots are in the militant wing of the opposition as an organizer in the violent street protests known as Guarimbas. Channeling energy from these protests, he founded right-wing opposition party Popular Will, alongside opposition leader Leopoldo Lopez. Lopez has been martyred as a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International and is painted as a hero across Western media, allegedly banished for opposing the regime. In reality, he's on mere house arrest for leading violent street insurrections that left dozens dead. He was also part of the US-backed coup in 2002. Both are deeply connected to US regime change front groups like USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy. By 2010, International agencies were generously pouring up to $50 million per year into funding the Venezuelan opposition movement. With Lopez out of commission, Guaido has been groomed to replace him. Guaido even admitted there's not a single thing he does without Lopez's guidance. According to the Wall Street Journal, Guaido's declaration as president was planned by Lopez and just three other opposition leaders, two of whom are not even in Venezuela and came as a complete surprise to the rest of the coalition. Even Waido was reportedly hesitant to make the move. And it was the phone call from Mike Pence the day before that gave him the reassurance he needed. As a White House official explained to the Washington Post, we have been engaged with the same strategy, to build international pressure, help organize the internal opposition, and push for a peaceful restoration of democracy. But that internal peace was missing, the official said. Waido was the peace we needed for our strategy to be coherent and complete. Sounds like a pretty open and shut case of a U.S. CIA regime change plot. But all of their rhetoric is about the restoration of democracy. So let's take a look at that claim. Here's the most common explanation. Maduro's political ambition became evident in December 2015. Two years after he became president, a coalition of opposition parties called the Democratic Unity Roundtable, or MUD, won a two-thirds majority in the National Assembly, putting Maduro's rule at risk. In response, Maduro quickly forced out several Supreme Court justices and filled the positions with cronies loyal to him. In March 2016, the court ruled to strip the opposition-led National Assembly of its powers. Maduro held a vote in July to elect a new governing body called the National Constituent Assembly, which would have the power to rewrite Venezuela's constitution and essentially replace the National Assembly and leave virtually no opposition to Maduro's rule. Nothing about this is true. Let's look at the facts conveniently left out. First, Maduro did not replace the Supreme Court with his own supporters. The terms of 13 Supreme Court justices were up in 2015. According to the Constitution, it's the job of the National Assembly to approve new justices. So that's what they did. The outgoing National Assembly approved judges aligned with their interests, which is exactly what happens in this country. Second, Maduro did not strip the National Assembly of its power. 
the opposition took over a majority of the National Assembly in 2016. For the first time since Chavismo took power in 1999, the opposition finally had some political power. So one would think they would use it to push all their solutions to the crises they're always talking about. Instead, they used the National Assembly as a tool of sabotage to make Venezuela's problems even worse. But while they weren't punished for that, they ended up being in contempt of court, as Alfred de Zayas explained. And we all believe in the rule of law. We all believe in the separation of powers, in checks and balances. And uh, this National Assembly, since day one, when it was elected in 2015, aimed at the, uh, well, at a parliamentary coup against uh, Maduro. The program was called La Salida, the exit. And uh, they completely acted ultra vires. There was another problem with this National Assembly at the time. It had been determined that uh, three, at least three, uh, deputies, uh, parliamentarians, uh, had been elected uh, through fraud. Uh, this was uh, demonstrated, and the Supreme Court was called uh, to make a decision, and they instructed the National Assembly, as it is foreseen in the Constitution of Venezuela, uh, to rerun those elections. And this National Assembly was uh, confrontational. It was intransigent, didn't want to do that. Uh, so it was declared in contempt. So since that moment on, uh, whatever the National Assembly does uh, has no legal validity in the context of Venezuelan constitutional law. It's not for us, Americans or Swiss, or French to say we disagree. That is for the Venezuelan authorities to determine whether the actions of the National Assembly are constitutional or not. Now we get to the Constituent Assembly, widely condemned as a strangely termed self-coup. I was in Venezuela during the run-up to the Constituent Assembly election. It was widely considered as a call for peaceful dialogue with the country's opposition. And it was completely legal. Article 347 of the Constitution allows for the creation of the Constituent Assembly. Here's the truth. It was absolutely not stacked with Maduro's supporters. It was a huge democratic process in which all citizens were eligible to run. Not only was the opposition eligible to run, but highly encouraged by the government to do so. Over 8 million Venezuelans participated in the election of these delegates. But the opposition called for a boycott of the election and some factions even responded with violence. At least two Chavista candidates were assassinated by opposition militants. And on election day, around 200 polling places were violently attacked to intimidate voters, leading to around 10 deaths. Yes, the Constituent Assembly is now full of socialists, but only because they were the only ones who participated and were democratically elected by millions. Whether or not you agree with all of these actions, one thing is irrefutable. They are all legal according to the Constitution, written, developed, and voted on by the entire Venezuelan population. I'm not telling you that you have to like the Socialist Party. I'm just saying that you should respect the Venezuelan Constitution. The basis of Guaido's legitimacy is that there's no democracy, therefore the sitting president is illegitimate. The funny thing is, the opposition officials making that case got their seats in office through the same election system they've always said is rigged. So every election is stolen except when they win. The fact is, Venezuela's voting system has more checks and verifications than most countries. A system of voter cards, fingerprints, and more make fraud near impossible. Every vote can be audited and verified, as they often are. Their elections are also heavily monitored by independent international observers. Surprisingly, it was the opposition who asked the UN to not send observers to the 2018 election, which could have proved alleged voter fraud. The opposition could have actually won that election, but instead they boycotted it. Nobody should run and nobody should vote. When opposition leader Henry Falcone disrupted the plan and filed his candidacy, the MUD opposition coalition expelled him. 
and the White House threatened to sanction him if he didn't drop out. In the end, Maduro won with 6.2 million votes, which is 31% of eligible voters. This is the same percentage Barack Obama won in the 2008 election. Not only that, but the elections were verified by four different international organizations with observers from over a dozen countries. One of those observers is the former Spanish Prime Minister, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero, who said, I do not have any doubt about the voting process. It is an advanced, automated voting system. But since the opposition still deems it unfair, they're now invoking Article 233 of the Constitution, saying if Maduro wasn't really elected, there's a vacuum of power that puts them in charge. Article 233 defines a vacuum of power as one of these things. One, the president's death, resignation, or impeachment. Two, permanent physical or mental incapacity. Three, abandonment of post. Or four, a recall election. Maduro fits none of those definitions. But even if he did, Article 233 clearly states that it's the vice president, not the National Assembly president, who would replace him. The entire thing is a concoction that's easily debunked. Also, the urgency of regime change by Washington and Waido is masked in the notion that Maduro's security forces are crushing dissent and wantonly executing peaceful protesters. After Waido declared himself president, he called for huge rallies in the streets of Caracas. Hundreds of thousands, as far as the eye could see, heeded that call. These happened entirely peacefully and with no government interference, like I saw firsthand in 2017. But certain protests are violent, where armed wings set up flaming street barricades and confront security forces with Molotov cocktails, bombs, and guns. Such a blatant misrepresentation of the facts comes as no surprise. Here at Empire Files, we've already seen this playbook before. While in Venezuela during the deadly protests in 2017, where over 140 people were killed. The majority of the deaths were caused by opposition protesters, either directly by assassinations, lynchings, and other violence, or indirectly by the deadly Guarimba barricades that caused many accidents. Facts like these slip through the coverage of an obedient press. Why do you think the corporate media is so unified and lockstep behind this regime change narrative yet bemoan entities like Russia Today and Telesaur as state propaganda organs? Well, uh, as I said, uh, what uh, drives uh, the world is the economy. What drives the world is money. And uh, the corporate moguls uh, who control and own uh, the press uh, have an interest in having a world composed uh, of uh, the one percent that will uh, rule everything and administer everything for our own good, or so they claim. And um, uh, it is, uh, as I say, scandalous uh, that uh, they do not give uh, the coverage, the attention, to things uh, published by academics. Now, we've been talking about fake news, about the ocean of lies that we read in the papers every day. But uh, it's not just the lies that create the problem, it's the absence of information. When uh, a whole dimension is suppressed and you do not hear anything about other points of view, sooner or later you accept the narrative that yes, there is a humanitarian crisis, ergo you need a humanitarian intervention, and if Maduro doesn't leave by his own free will, it'll be necessary to topple him. And then you find someone like Juan Guaido, uh, who is going to play the game. I mean, every country has opportunists uh, and uh, who will be uh, the agent uh, for uh, the United States and for United States transnationals and for the United States oil industry. There are uh, billions of dollars in profits uh, to be made in uh, Venezuela and thus far, the profits have been used uh, to satisfy the social needs of the Venezuelan people. Uh, that, of course, is likely to end 
if uh, this uh, coup is uh, successful. I mean, if you want to have a coup d'etat in uh, Venezuela, say so. You want a coup d'etat because you want American business to move in and to take the profits. That's where it's at. But it's not a question that uh, you sympathize with the poor, suffering Venezuelan people when it is the United States that is causing that suffering. Well, at least John Bolton is speaking plainly about taking the oil. You know, you have him on corporate yes, media he has. talking about that. But of course, a lot of people mask this interventionism with humanitarianism. Let's talk about NGOs, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch. People maybe understandably distrust the corporate media, but they do trust entities like these. They consider themselves impartial watchdogs. Um, why do you think their reporting on Venezuela is just as heavily skewed? Well, there is and has been for a while a human rights industry. Since 1980, when I joined uh, the office, uh, at that time it was called the Division on Human Rights of the United Nations, then a Center for Human Rights, now the Office of the High Commissioner, uh, I've had the opportunity of observing uh, the behavior of non-governmental organizations. Organizations that started out uh, very, very committed for human rights and really uh, honestly concerned uh, with uh, the suffering of human beings have been bought out. Uh, the donors essentially uh, set the music. I am so disappointed with many of these non-governmental organizations because I know, for instance, uh, that uh, individuals, civil society, non-governmental organizations in Venezuela, they have produced reports and they have made these reports available to Amnesty International and to Human Rights Watch and, of course, to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, I've used these reports in my own report. I took them seriously. But since they do not play the game, since uh, they are telling you a story that the corporate media doesn't want out and the donors to Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, etc., also don't want out, uh, so it gets suppressed. So here you have, as I say, the human rights industry betraying human rights, abandoning the concept of human dignity and using only the rhetoric uh, of human rights. The opposition against Maduro is broad and comprised of many factions, moderates, progressives, even some socialists. They oppose Maduro, but respect the constitution and democratic process. But the faction currently trying to seize power is the extreme right. Within just 48 hours of declaring himself president, Guaido tried to seize Venezuela's oil production. According to S&P Global Platz, before the coup attempt began, Guaido had already drafted plans for mass privatization of the oil. What are the potential human rights implications if this coup indeed does go through? Well, uh, what will happen if the coup uh, goes through is that you will have uh, what uh, Naomi Klein called uh, disaster capitalism uh, forced down the throat of the uh, Venezuelan people. You will have retrogression in the enjoyment of uh, economic, social, and cultural rights. You will have the privatization, not only of the oil industry, but you will have privatization of uh, gold mining and bauxite mining and um, coltan uh, mining. Uh, they will do away with healthcare. They will do away with um, uh, subsidized uh, housing, et cetera, et cetera, as happened already. I mean, I refer our viewers to the Carmona Decree of 11 April 2002. Back in the year 2002, the United States uh, co-financed and conspired uh, 
in connection with a coup d'etat against Hugo Chavez. That was the 11th of April. The coup d'etat lasted less than 48 hours because uh, Chavez was enormously popular and uh, the military liberated him and brought him back to Miraflores. Pedro Carmona, the leader of the uh, coup, in those 48 hours, did away with 49 pieces of social legislation, dissolved the Supreme Court, dissolved the National Assembly, because, of course, that National Assembly was Chavista. You will see what a right-wing uh, decree that is that uh, has basically uh, no democratic legitimacy, whatever, but that entails uh, going back, uh, and that's what they want. They want to mm -hmm. go back to the 1980s and 90s, what they perceive as the good old days when the rich were rich and the poor were poor. You know, how could this erupt into a civil war here? And how can dialogue happen if the opposition is neglecting it? I mean, Maduro's already agreed to it, but the opposition's refusing to do it. Well, Maduro has been asking the opposition for dialogue uh, since the elections in 2015. And he has given the opposition ever opportunity. Uh, but if one side uh, thinks we don't have to dialogue because uh, the big guy in Washington with his big stick is going to hit Maduro over the head and is going to catapult uh, Juan Guaido in the position uh, of uh, uh, president of the wealthiest uh, oil producing country in the world. Uh, so uh, civil war, and I told that to members of the opposition, you may topple Maduro, but the seven, eight, or nine million committed Chavistas are not simply going to roll over. They are not going to disappear. So you may find yourself in a situation of a bloody civil war. Do you want that for your people? But civil war is sadly not the worst possible scenario here. The reality of a U.S. military attack and invasion of Venezuela is very real and all under the pretext that the military must deliver the very same life-saving medicines they've been blocking from the country for years. The beat of war drums is deafening. We've now learned U.S. Special Forces have been sent to Puerto Rico, the usual staging ground for U.S. invasions. And the U.S. also threatened the Maduro government with invasion in secret negotiations. And on February 18, Trump again threatened the government, telling Venezuelan soldiers to recognize Guaido now or there would be, quote, no easy exit, and no way out. There's no reason to take these as empty threats. John Bolton orchestrated the most catastrophic war of my lifetime. Elliot Abrams facilitated an actual genocide. And Trump is currently carpet bombing the Middle East. We know how far they're willing to go for big oil and the war machine. Potentially millions of lives are at stake. All people who believe in sovereignty and peace have a role to play here to do everything in our power to stop this from happening and to shut it down if it starts.